Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Be Healed Global Christian Church this morning. And we are going to enter into a time of uh, prayer and intercession. Amen. Let's go to uh, let's go to Revelation chapter five, verse twelve through fourteen. Revelation chapter five, verse twelve through fourteen. The Bible says, saying with a loud voice, "Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, and wisdom, and strength, and honor." and glory and blessing and every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as are in the sea and all that are in them heard i heard i saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and unto the lamb forever and ever and the four beasts said amen and these are the four and twenty. These are the four and twenty elders that fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. Amen. So this morning we are going to go before the Lord and join these twenty-four elders and the angels and the cherubim that worship him day and night. So stand up this morning as we begin to worship him in spirit and in truth. Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you for this opportunity to come again once into your presence. We thank you, Father, because you are God and beside you there's no other. Beside you there's no rock like we know, Father God. We bless your holy name. We glorify you. We magnify your holy name. Lord, we join the angels this morning. We join the cherubim and the seraphim. We join the 24 elders, Lord, that cry out day and night, Holy, holy are you, Lord God Almighty, who was, who is, and is to come. We just give you glory this morning. We give you honor. We give you rich, all the riches and the power and the dominion belong to you, my Father God. In the name of Jesus, who all the, is the Lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world. We cry holy this morning. Holy, holy, holy. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we just bless you, Lord Jesus. We glorify you. We honor you for blessing and honor and glory and power be unto you, my Father God, who lives forever and ever, the one who is seated on the throne, for you changeth not. Lord, we adore you this morning. We glorify you. We exalt your holy name. We thank you, even Jesus, the Son of the living God. We cry, Hosanna, the Son of this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, we thank you, Jesus. We thank you for going to the cross for us. We thank you that by your stripes we are healed, we are delivered, and we are set free. Oh, we thank you, Jesus, for all that you've done on the cross for the finished work of the cross. Spirit of the living God, we magnify you this morning. We say thank you, Holy Spirit. We acknowledge your presence this morning. Have your way in this place as we pray, as we pray for nations, as we pray for the sick, as we pray for, for, for any need that is that, that is in our midst this day in the name of Jesus. Oh, blessed Holy Spirit, Spirit of truth, Spirit of wisdom, Spirit of revelation and insight. Oh, blessed Holy Spirit, Spirit of grace and supplication. We acknowledge your presence this morning. We thank you. We bless you. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. We are going to go to Hebrews chapter 12. As we ask for forgiveness of our sins this morning, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 15, the Bible says, Amen. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, lest not any root of bitterness springing up trouble you and thereby many may be defiled. Amen. So this morning we're going to ask God to, we're going to repent. Let me say, we're going to repent for holding any kind of bitterness because like we wrote there, bitterness defiles you and many are contaminated. I think uh, King uh, the Amplified says many are defiled because of the root of uh, bitterness. So this morning, let's go before the Lord and ask for release from this root of bitterness. First of all, repent of holding bitterness towards people, towards those that have hurt you, those that have wronged you, those that have been unkind towards you, those that have 
be malicious to you, whatever they have done to you, don't hold that bitterness. Let's release that bitterness in the name of Jesus so that we are not defiled, we are not contaminated. We don't want this to hinder us from receiving the word this morning. Begin to pray, Father, in the name of Jesus. I come before you this morning to ask for mercy, O oh Lord. I, I, I repent of holding bitterness towards people that have hurt me, people that have hurt my family, people that have been unkind to me, or, or, or cruel in the attitude towards me. Lord, people that have been malicious in, in, their, in their ways, Lord. Father, I ask, for, I ask to, you to help me, Spirit of the living God, to release this root of bitterness in Jesus' mighty name. I, I ask for release this morning from this root of bitterness. I don't want to be con con contaminated in the name of Jesus. I don't want to be defiled by the root of bitterness. Father, you have said in your word, in 1 John 1, verse 9, that if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us for more unrighteousness. So, Lord, this morning I ask for, I thank you that because I've asked for mercy, Lord, you have forgiven me of this sin of bitterness. In the name of Jesus, I receive my forgiveness. I thank you, Father. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you, Holy Spirit. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. We're going to go to Hebrews, uh, excuse me, Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12, verse 14. Romans chapter 12, verse 14. The Bible says, Bless those who persecute you, who are cruel in their attitude towards you. Bless them and do not curse them. Amen. Amen. So we have just asked God to forgive us our sins, and God has forgiven us. So right now, we are going just to bless the people that have hurt us. Those are the ones that we just prayed just before, before this prayer. So let's bless them. You know them. You know what they need. Some may be needing a job. Some may be needing healing. Some may be needing whatever is it, provision or whatever it is. So begin to bless those that persecute you in the name of Jesus. Father, this morning I come before you according to your word in Romans 12 verse 14. You said to bless those who persecute us those who have been cruel in the attitude towards us. So Lord, this morning I bless those people right now in the name of Jesus. Those that are looking for jobs, Father, I pray that you give them good and paying, good paying, satisfying jobs in Jesus' name. Those that are needing healing, Father, heal them, Father, wherever, wherever is wrong in their lives, make it right in the name of Jesus. Those that are looking for financial provision, Father, meet them at the very point of need, even this week, Father, in the name of Jesus. Those that need emotional healing, Lord, touch their hearts, Father, in the name of Jesus. Those that are just, um, uh, those that are uh, maybe having mental, uh, mental, um, mental anguish, Lord, I pray there be healing in their minds, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Every need, Lord, that is represented, let it be made by you, God, in the name of Jesus. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Spirit of the living God. Lord, we bless you. Lord, we glorify you in the name of Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. We are going to plead the blood of Jesus. We know the blood of Jesus has so many benefits. In Hebrews 10 verse 19, Hebrews 10 verse 19, the Bible says, Therefore, brethren, since we have full freedom and confidence to enter into the holy of holies by the power and virtue in the blood of Jesus. Amen. So that's one of the many benefits to that. The blood will help us to enter in through the holies of holies. So this morning we don't want to be hindered by anything. Let's begin to plead the blood of Jesus. Claim the benefits of the blood of Jesus. Yes, in Jesus' mighty name. Father, we thank you for the precious blood of Jesus. The blood that washes, delivers, and sanctifies. The blood that sets us free. We thank you for the precious blood of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the blood gives us access to enter into the holies of holies. We thank you, Father God, that as we are covered in the blood, sin cannot have dominion over us. We thank you, Father, for the blood. We cover ourselves in the blood of Jesus. We cover our minds in the blood. We cover our bodies in the blood of Jesus. We cover everything that concerns us in the blood. Our families, our homes, our ministries, our businesses in the blood of Jesus. Lord, we thank you for the blood. We thank you for the blood. 
We thank you for the blood of Jesus. Lord, we thank you that the blood has given us confidence and power to enter in this morning. In the name of Jesus. We thank you for the blood, all oh, the blood, all oh, the blood of Jesus, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 8. The Bible says, but we belong to the day. Therefore, let us be sober and be and put on the breastplate, breastplate, corset of faith and love, for a helmet of hope of our salvation. Amen. Amen. We are going to put on the helmet of salvation this morning, so that as the word is being brought forth because of the message today. Amen. We don't want the, 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 our minds to be out there. We don't want distractions. So as we put the helmet of salvation, let God take over. Let the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit take over our minds, our emotions this morning in the name of Jesus. So that emotions, our emotions are not in the way. Father, in the name of Jesus, we put on the, the helmet of salvation this morning. We thank you, Father God, as we put on this helmet. Father God, all the emotions are gone in the name of Jesus. We ask you, Father, to touch our minds this morning. Transform our minds in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Lord, we ask you to conform our wills to your will, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Father, we thank you. Jesus, we thank you, Spirit of the living God. We thank you that we will not think the same way like we normally think, but Father God, that our spiritual senses will be activated this morning in the name of Jesus. That, we, that, that our spiritual senses, spiritual touch, spiritual hearing, spiritual taste of God's spiritual hearing, Lord, will not be the same in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. We put on Christ this morning in the name of Jesus. Oh, Rebecca Sanda, as we bind our minds to the mind of Jesus Christ, we thank you, Father God, that we have ready minds to receive this morning in the name of Jesus. As we get the lines of our minds this morning, we thank you that our left hemispheres reset our right hemispheres are reset this morning we thank you lord we thank you jesus we thank you spirit of the living god we decree that we are not forgetful we don't have dementia we don't have insomnia alzheimer's we rebuke you right now by the power of the blood of jesus christ of nazareth we thank you father god that our minds are ready to receive this morning we have sound minds this morning in the name of jesus Jesus Christ of Nazareth, O Shere Candere Besse, Remandere Kese Sheteya, Mare de Keto Toko Sata, Re de Keto Telemandereba, O Remandereba Sata Ramantere, O Shekete Telemandereba, Hallelujah Ramase Keshe, Re Yasaka Sher Yasaka She. We thank you, Father, that our minds are transformed this morning in the name of Jesus. We bless your holy name. We glorify you. We give you all the glory, all the honor, all the majesty and dominion. Blessed be your glorious name forever and ever. In Jesus' name, we have prayed with thanksgiving. Amen, amen, and amen. 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 We are going to enter into a time of praise and worship. Reverend Pauline, over to you. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. God is good. Amen. Amen. 
there is no one like our God. Today we celebrate the kingship of Jesus. There is no one like our God. Psalm 24 says, lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. Who is this king of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory. Amen, amen. In that day, they had celebrated Jesus' triumphal entry in Jerusalem. But they were celebrating before it was finished. But today, we are privileged to celebrate the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords when it is finished. He is the King that seated at the right hand of God the Father. He is the King that reigns forevermore. He is the King that lives forever. And they, they said that they took branches and they went down the road to meet him. They shouted, praise God, blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Hail to the King of Israel. Hail to the King of the church. Hail to the King of the body of Christ. Hail to this King. Amen. We are saying it to the King of Kings who has proven himself alive, who is there, who has always been there and has never left us. This King died and he rose again.
His throne is established through love. But oh God, your steadfast love to us, oh God, has permeated through our hearts and our minds. And you are enthroned forever and ever and ever because of your love. Oh, this King is our provider, defender, master of the universe. You know me. You are an awesome wonder. Now tell him, provider. provider. Defender. Defender. Master of the universe. Master of the universe. You know me. You are an awesome wonder. Hallelujah. Sing it again. Provider. Provider. Defender. Master of the universe. You know me. You are an awesome wonder.
that Lord the King of glory may enter in. Let the King of glory enter in our hearts, oh God, we enthrone you. You are the word and that word was with God and that, that word was God and Father that word is what became King and became flesh amongst us and God we behold your beauty and today we open our hearts, oh God, to your word. That word that is the King, that word that is God, the word that will bring life. Father, we honor you and magnify your name this moment. Your majesty be enthroned in our midst. In Jesus' name we worship. Oh, Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise be to your name. We say thank you, Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. We worship you. We bless you. We glorify you. We magnify you. We thank you, Master. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Spirit of the living God. We bless your holy name this morning. We are just so grateful. Mm, mm, mm. We are so grateful, Lord. We just can't thank you enough. Words are not enough to just say thank you, Jesus, for what you did for us, for the victory that you have given us. Oh, Lord, we thank you. We just say thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you. We have victory in the name of Jesus. We have victory. We have victory. We have victory. We say thank you for the victory that you have given us. The victory that you wrought for us. Oh Jesus, on this Passover day when you began to that journey from Jerusalem on that donkey. Lord, we say thank you. You gave us victory. Oh Jesus, as the people shouted Hosanna, hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Glory. 
Glory be to God. Hallelujah. Oh, we celebrate him today. We celebrate you, Lord. We celebrate you every day. Oh, blessed be your name. This is just a good day. I like, you know, our church is called Be Healed. Christian Church. Hallelujah. Be Healed Global. It's Be Healed Global. It's not just for us here in this church. It's global. Wherever you're watching us from, be healed. We invite you to be healed. Be healed in every area of your life. Be healed in your finances. Be healed in your marriage. Be healed in your relationship. Be healed in, in, in your business. Be healed on your jobs. Be healed in your families. Be healed in everything that the devil has attacked. Be healed in this church. We believe in the healing of Jesus Christ. And we tell you, Jesus Christ, the Messiah, be healed. I want to tell you something from the book of Acts, verse nine, chapter 9, verse 34. You know, when Peter, in verse 32, it says, Now, as Peter went here and there. You see, in our ministry, be healed. We have also the other side of our outreach, which is the, you know, the evangelical, well, in the in traveling part of our ministry, which is the Be Healed uh, Global, uh, Be Healed Global Outreach, where we go out, I, we do travel ministry. Um, and so we do a lot of healing and deliverance and we go out in different places to do healing, um, you know, send deliverance, whatever, and meetings and all that, conferences and things. And so we travel, we also go here and there, amen. And so now as Peter went here and there among them all, we do that. And he we went down also to the saints who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas who had been bed fast for eight years and was paralyzed. Now, th verse 34 is what is important. And Peter said to him, now right now, we're not really traveling physically, but we're traveling via social media. We are traveling on the internet, hallelujah. We are traveling online, we're traveling on TV, we are traveling everywhere, we are global, hallelujah. And so, as Peter said, and I want to borrow the words of Peter right now in the name of Jesus, and Aeneas said to him, Jesus Christ the Messiah now makes you whole. Right now, be healed in, as, as we are traveling all over worldwide. Jesus Christ the Messiah makes you whole. Therefore, be healed and be made whole in Jesus' name wherever you are. Whatever sickness, disease, virus has met you today in the name of Jesus, I decree and I declare over you, be healed, be made whole now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. As the mandate is on this ministry, be healed. The anointing of healing that is on this ministry that destroys sickness, disease, virus, all the way to the root that kills cancer, that kills tumor, that kills HIV. No sickness, disease exists. Any person that has had any contact with this ministry, we have we have testimonies of people being healed over email, testimonies of people being healed over the phone, testimonies of people waking up from commas via email, via phone. The anointing that is on this ministry, may you have an encounter wherever you are, the encounter with the Jesus that we know in this ministry, Jesus Christ the Messiah of Acts 9.34, may he make you whole. Now, hallelujah, glory be to God. This is the day of your victory. Shout Hosanna, glory, glory, hallelujah. Ramosa candere bossi, rimosa candere bossi, rimosi candere rabosse che, re bossi che, re rebossa, re candere. Demons leave now in the name of Jesus. 
You see, Jesus said to us in our ministry that this is the year of shalom, the year of peace. He says, my peace I give to you. This is the peace that he's given us, amen? He says he gave us a word for our ministry for this year, that this is the year of peace, the year of nothing missing, nothing broken, and nothing lacking. And so if it is the year of peace, the year where, which is given us where there's nothing missing, nothing broken, and nothing lacking, that means these things that are attacking us, these things that are causing us to lack peace are not supposed to be in our lives. These things must go in Jesus' name. These things are not to be tolerated. These things must go. Amen? In the name of Jesus. And so when we identify what these things are, these things are to go in the name of Jesus. Now, I remember when the people of God were under so much attack, severe attack, in, the, in Egypt, God heard their cry and he came down to deliver them. And when he came down to deliver them, what did he do? They went through, you know, the Red Sea and he, he promised them. He had a land where he promised that he was taking them. He was taking them too. We, we did that a few weeks ago when we started this series. And we saw that God in Deuteronomy 1.8, he said, there's the land that I promised to give you. There it is, go in and get it. And so we know they had to physically go in and get the land. They had to physically go and possess the land. But in our dispensation, thank God for Jesus. In our New Testament dispensation, this grace dispensation, everything has already been given to us. We possess the things by faith. Amen. Amen. Now, the thing about it is, as we'll go through the, the scriptures today, um, we'll see how you know, God wants us to have these things. In fact, he's already given them to us. Let's go to Second Peter. So if Jesus wants us, you know, he says this is the year of peace. Now, 
when we look at that, it's like, well, but the peace is already given it to us, then why are we not having peace in our lives? Why is it, do we have to have a year of peace? Well, Jesus is saying it's a year only because most of us haven't really, you know, um, done or we haven't really implemented or taken what he's already given us and, you know, appropriated it in our lives. And so he's wanting us to really focus this year on taking what he's, give, he's already given us and applying it and appropriating it in our lives. And it's also because of the attack. The enemy attack is intense. Look at what's happening in the world with the pandemic, the virus, and everything going on out there. Um, I just learned this week <clears throat> that they said they dis declassified. I think they did it last year. I just found out this week because I'm not really so much into paying attention to what's going on. That's not my priority you know, like making sure that I'm keeping up with the virus information. Um, I'm, I'm more to keeping up with God's information than the virus information. So I'm behind with whatever is going on there. And But I just found out that they declassified coronavirus 19 to from a pandemic to a, just a virus because they, they say, and that's cr crazy, but they say that not enough people were sick. Uh, okay, that, that's another story for another day. Not enough people were sick, so it cannot be classified as a pandemic. Uh, I'm like, really? How many people did you want to be sick? To so, okay, well, well, that's a discussion for a different day. But anyhow, so based on that, you know, I believe now I'm understanding why the Lord gave me last year this prophetic word to say, and he gave it to me earlier, Mid, almost mid last year to say next year is the year of peace and so he usually gives me the prophetic words like in June July so it's not like the prophetic word came in December because of what was going on no I usually get my prophetic words for the following year the year before so I start hearing and working on it before but I don't release it until you know the, when he tells me to release it and so I'm working on this word year of peace year of peace but it's not because of, because, okay, we need to have a year of something, but because of the attack on the mind. Look at what has happened with this pandemic. A lot of people, even though it has affected people physically on the body, people have gotten sick, and some people are still dealing with the remnant of those who've had the attack on the body, you know, many will tell you that they still have to deal with the after effects you know, of the coronavirus, those who've actually gone through it and survived it, um, but now they're dealing with like side effects of it. Um, and those who, some of them didn't survive it, you know, and then so, even though there's the physical aspect of it, but then mo for most people, even though they never actually even got it, most of us who never got it, and but most of us are in the word, but then there are those who are not in the word, and even those who are in the word. Now, I'm dealing with mostly those who are in the word, um, who are still now, have, have opened their minds and allowed what is going on and what they're seeing to attack their minds. And so the enemy has attacked them. And so though they are not physically attacked by the virus, they are mentally attacked by the virus. And hear me out here today because this will help you. I'm telling you, the Lord wants to set people free today. Amen. This is today's message. It's going to set you free. Now, if you didn't listen to last week, you've got to connect last week to this week. So I'm just continuing from last week. I, I talked a lot last week. I started off with that. But I'm telling you, so this one we're focusing on getting you set free. So last week we talked about a little bit about, you went in a little bit about Ephesians. Now, I want to just, before I talk, I had to, did I tell you to go to 2 Peter? 2 Peter chapter 1. Because we, today we are talking about strongholds, but before we go to strongholds, um, I want to say something about the weapons. Because I know that most of us believers know about spiritual warfare. And most of us use spiritual warfare in one area in, ter in terms of we know about fighting. But in the book of Ephesians, you know, if you... Um, study the book of Ephesians, not read, but study it, you'll find that Ephesians has given us weapons 
starting from the head all the way through to the toe. And it covers the whole body when you do warfare, spiritual warfare. And in Ephesians, it tells us the actual enemies that we're fighting and their, their ranking. It tells you the different soldiers, to, so to say, that you'll be dealing with in the enemy. He, it tells us this is Satan's army. This is the group that you're fighting with in Satan's army. Okay, these are the demons that you're fighting with, the satanic spirits, and these are their levels, okay? And these are their levels of power, it tells you. And each one, this is their assignment, it tells you. This is what this one does, and this one, this is what they do. So it tells you their focus and their purpose. So this is what Ephesians six twelve tells you. So that's why I said study. Reading, you won't know that. But if you study, you'll know this one does this, this, this is responsible for this, this, this. This one does this, this, this. And their rankings in Satan's kingdom. Okay, because Satan has a kingdom and it's organized. So it's not just anyhow kind of kingdom, it's organized. Um, and he has board meetings, believe you me. He has board meetings just like in the world. He, you know, we have meetings and he sends out his little demons and stuff. This one does this. Eat, you know, eat these spirits of discouragement, demons of sickness, all those, they have assignments. He sends them out on assignment. That's why if you were to read in the Gospels, you'll find those demons, Legion, who had his group of people. He was on assignment from Satan. The reason why Legion, when they saw Jesus, they were afraid to go back when they saw Jesus. They didn't want Jesus to send them back because they were on assignment. And that's why they were like, oh, no. Okay, at least send us into the pigs. You know why? Because they had not completed their assignment. Had they gone back to the kingdom of Satan without finishing their assignment they were sent to do, which was to kill that guy, not only they were, were they sent to make him mad, that was part of the assignment, but they were supposed to finish him by killing him, and they didn't succeed. When Jesus came, Jesus was casting them out, sending them out, evicting them. So they were begging Jesus. They begged Jesus. Demons were begging, okay, oh, please, don't send us out of here, because Jesus had to send them back to where they came from, which is back to their, you know, where, to their offices or the headquarters, which is the bottomless pit. If they had gone back there, Satan would have tortured them for not completing their assignment. And so rather than being tortured, they preferred, okay, send us into the pigs, please, please, begging Jesus, send us into the pigs. And so they were afraid to go back because they knew what was going to happen to them. So because they were sent on assignment. So when demons come, okay, so today's service is a different kind of service, you know, so we are healed, be healed, okay. Amen. This is be healed because today is the kind of deliverance service, amen. Be healed global, because we got to get people healed, amen? And so, um, so yeah, so they were sent back. You know, they, they begged Jesus to go rather than, we'd rather go do something else, kill the pigs or whatever. Kill something, because our assignment is to kill. That was the point. They needed to kill something, because they would rather not. And so that's why you find demons roaming around. When they kill, in, even in the hospitals, when people die, demons kill. You know, um... And I have to say this, God doesn't need a sickness to kill a person, for a person to go to heaven. If you don't believe me, read the Bible, read about Moses, read about Aaron. I mean, God would tell Moses, okay, go to that mountain there because you're about to die. Because he's 120 at this point, and he's like, okay, now your time is up, get your stuff together, and go to that mountain because you're about to die. I mean, they were preparing for death, not like it was a bad thing. Like, okay, your time is up, you finished your assignment, go to the mountain, and you're going to die because now I just want you to see the land that you were going to go to, but you're not going there because you disobeyed me here, you didn't, you know, you didn't honor me, but I just want you to see the land, and when you see it, now you're coming up to heaven, you're about to die. For them, death wasn't like a bad thing, and everybody knew, okay, he's about to die. People were preparing. Not the way we do it now. Oh my God. Oh my God. No. Christians, these were believers and they knew, okay, he's, his time is up. He's finished his assignment. He's about to die. And it wasn't a bad thing. In our day now, it's like, okay, a sickness has to kill. No, a sickness doesn't have to, have to kill you as a believer. If it's your time, you finish your assignment, God can talk to you and say, okay, 
You know, your time is up. I'm going to take you. So don't believe the lie. And I want you to underline this word lie, circle it, lie, that a sickness has to kill you. When a sickness kills a person, it's from the devil because he has sent a demon yeah. on assignment. Yeah. It's a demon on assignment who has a demon of sickness, a spirit of infirmity. That's what kills, not God. Get this straight. God never kills a person by sickness. Now, a believer, when somebody who is a believer dies because of sickness and you accept that that person died through a sickness, it's you who is accepting. But it's not God who said, I took them home. Oh, God took them home through a sickness. No, no, no. Never, 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 never. Let me tell you that. Never. Find it in the Bible. You can write me a letter. You can cut me up. I don't care. It is not in the Bible. Never, 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 never will God kill a person because God heals. Amen. Why would God heal and kill? Never. So lie, lie. Put again there, lie. Yeah. Okay. Because today we're doing deliverance. Amen. Amen. Is the truth all right? Amen. Amen. So it's demons, okay? So all these are demons. So virus is not from God. Hey, God, why are you allowing? It's not from God. It's demon of sickness on assignment from the devil to attack, to kill, steal, kill, and destroy. He is doing his MO, okay? This is his mission of operation. <laughs> That's what he's doing. He's out to do it because he wants souls and what do we want? We want souls in the kingdom. Is that, isn't that what we pray in the book of Timothy? We pray for souls that all may come to know in the knowledge of God. That's what we're praying for. So as we pray, you think when we're praying there's no counterattack? When we pray for souls in the kingdom of God, we are, uh, the fact that we are praying for people to be saved, that's causing, it's inciting anger in the kingdom of Satan. So now he's thinking, how do I get these people back? So he's coming up with a plan. Let's put sickness. Let's put discouragement. All those discouragement. Chief, chief, um, you know, demon is a spirit of discouragement mm -hmm. in the kingdom of Satan. Don't you know when you have discouragement, all these little ones come in, stress, this and that, and all those open doors to different sicknesses. I just don't have time to go through that today because I want to get to your mind. But I'm just trying to show you his strategy. That's why you need to know the strategy. So in Ephesians, it tells us to know the strategies. Ephesians is a book of warfare that teaches us the plans of the devil. So why I'm trying to tell you this about Ephesians is because we're going to talk about, you know, 2 Corinthians, and people mix that. It's in Ephesians, it tells us, I just wanted to touch on Ephesians. Oh, Lord, help me. Help me, Jesus. So in Ephesians 6 is where Apostle Paul actually outlines about, you know, um, I, you know, I'm not going to teach that today, but we may have to do something, maybe on the prayer line. But um, in, in Ephesians, he tells you everything that the weapon, every covering, everything that you need to use. Then it tells you about verse 17. The one that you need to use for the helmet, she used it in prayer today. Helmet of salvation, which covers the head. Mm -hmm. And the sword of the spirit, which the spirit wields, which is the word of God. The helmet of the salvation, and it has the sword. So we, when, you, when you have the helmet covering, and the sword that the spirit wields, which is the word of God. What does Revelation tell us? The book of Revelation tells us that when, he, when Jesus comes, it will be like a sword that will be cutting. You should read Revelation. It's a sword. That's the word. The sword is the word. When the word comes, it's a double-edged sword. That not that what the word said? The Bible says, those of you who read the Bible, the Bible says the word is a double-edged sword. When it comes, it's just going to be cut and boom, 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 slice it. Boom, 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 boom. Hey, 
the word, the helmet, these two, write them down. Hmm. Now, most times people associate this book and 2 Corinthians with all this voodoo, witchcraft, what that, so we are just praying this prayer. Oh, fair all night. Hey, hey, principality, hey, we, without understanding. Uh, you know, I don't have a problem with you praying on it. Don't get me wrong when you hear me say these things, people of God. I'm not attacking, you know. When I say it all the time, it's because of, the Bible says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. And it's not good for people to be going on and on doing stuff which is wrong. Okay, I used to be there. I say it because I've done it. And God delivered me from that and taught me a better way of doing things. And when God taught me a better way of doing things, things changed in my life. I started to see victories with sweatless victories. When I sit back and, I mean, sometimes, even last week we were discussing with my husband, I'm like, man, when I look back in those days, especially like in the 90s, you know, I didn't have an, op I mean, I grew up most of my, I came here as a teenager. My mom brought us here when I was young. So I didn't have the opportunity to pray in Africa with people in Africa the way people pray in Africa. I've learned about how people pray in Africa here in America. And I've watched people from here in America, how they pray in Africa. And I've prayed with people from Africa here in America. And I've learned the style from here in America. I'm more American than I am African, you know, because I've lived here longer than I've lived in Africa. You know, I mean much more longer. I visit Africa. For me, home is America. Okay, when, I've, when I come to Africa, I'm visiting. <laughs> so, you know, so, um, so for me, but when I see that, you know, um, I see, I still am connected because I have family there. But when I see what people are doing and God is showing, I'm a person who said, God, I don't want to just do what other people are doing. I want to do what you've called me to do and show me how you want me to minister. I don't want to be a copycat. I don't want to copy somebody else and try to do and follow what they're doing. I need to be an original because I'm an original. Amen. Okay. I'm not going to do because somebody else is doing this. I do original what you called me to do. And so God shows me original stuff. And so that's why I may be weird to you. And that's okay. But the weird works. <laughs> that's all I can say. And so, but I started to see stuff and God will show me stuff. Man, it's bad. You know, um, but I copied stuff before, like when I was not even in ministry, because I was seeing, I was just being told, oh, this is what we do. I remember being in churches sometimes where I'll just be there and I'm not understanding what they're saying, but it's in African churches. And they're saying just die, 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 die. I'm seeing people call die. And I'm also just going die, 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 die. But I'm not sure what we're killing. You understand? And there I am dying, killing, killing stuff week after week. And then the following week, we're exchanging power. We're exchanging. I don't know what kind of power we're exchanging, but nothing is working. Now, I'm not trying to, you know, I'm, I'm really not trying to be calling out people's churches or whatever. I'm just saying it never worked. Three days doing this, do, it never worked. Nothing changed in my life. And I was like, and I was, Lord, this doesn't work. Then I would go with my Caucasian friends to their churches. And man, they'll just pray a prayer that was just like, okay, two minutes, whatever. And then the following week, is like, wow, I just got this thing. I prayed for that job for $135,000, and I got that job. And we didn't kill something. We didn't die, die, die. We just prayed for five minutes, and you got the job. And I'm like, we had to kill and do all this, and what happened? And I'm telling you, it was a pattern where... Every time I'm praying with my Caucasian friends and we were just like talking to the Lord, just talking to the Lord, things were happening. But then when I'll be with my African friends, we are killing all the time, killing this and doing this and things just never, never having any testimonies. And so when I went into ministry, I was like, something is wrong somewhere. Uh -uh, uh -uh. I said, Lord, <laughs> somebody. 
somebody is doing something wrong somewhere. Because when I'm with these guys and I pray with these guys, prayers get answered. When I'm with these guys, we're killing. We are having to labor. Something's not happening. What's going on? And but I was moved by them because the Africans, because I'm thinking, oh, oh, we have to, oh. But nothing was happening. But then when I'm with my Caucasian friends, man, it's just like sweatless victory. We just, oh Lord, we just love you, Lord. We just honor you, Lord. And Lord, we just ask you. And Lord, this, and I'm telling you, just simple, talking to God. And then the next thing I'm just seeing, boom, things are happening. I'm like, okay. So one day I sat down and I said, Lord, I need to know you. I need you to teach me how to pray. And the Holy Spirit started to teach me how to pray. And when he taught me how to pray, he started to teach me the wrong way. And, the, and he said, you don't need all that. You don't need that. You don't need. So he started to teach me warfare. I said, I need to understand warfare. The Holy Spirit taught me warfare how to do warfare right and the wrong way. So anyway, today I wanna to show you, I said all that, I'm not trying to offend anybody. If you feel that you need to labor, go ahead. I'm just saying, for me, it doesn't work that way because the Holy Spirit taught me a new way and the new way works best. Now, does it, do I not get into the spirit sometimes and I do that. But do I have to do it overnight? No, unless he tells me to. Do I have to run up some mountains in Texas which they don't have? No, uh, you know, do I have to sleep? Some, if, if, I, if I feel led, if he's telling me sleep on the floor, I'll do it. I mean, I'm led by the Holy Spirit. That's the difference. I don't do things because I want to do it. I'm led by the Holy Spirit. All my prayers now are spirit-led prayers. That's the difference. I don't do anything unless he tells me to do it. If he doesn't tell me to, if he says, go and run around the mountains in Texas, find one, I'll do it because he said it. If he said, do overnight, praying in the spirit 24 hours, I will do it. If he says, labor all night, I will do it because he said it, and that spirit led. But if he did say it, I'm not doing it. Because, oh, Reverend Pauline says, oh, Apostle, I feel, let's go to the mountain today. Let's look for one. I'm not going. Reverend Pauline, did God say so? Uh, where's the memo? I didn't get it. So if she got it, but I didn't get it, okay, Reverend Pauline, when you come back tomorrow, call me. I'm not going. You understand what I'm saying? Because she got it. That doesn't mean I have to accompany her. I need to be led by the Holy Spirit. Because why? I also have the Holy Spirit. You understand? I'm not just going to go because she's going. She's the one who's led. It's for her. It's not for me. I'm not going to tag along. Like one lady called me one time. Oh, I'm also, I'm fighting with this warlord. You know, you need, uh, I don't even know your fight with the warlord. Why am I getting involved? You know, please join me. Uh, no. I'm sleeping out here. Why am I getting uh, in a fight with a warlord? I don't even know the battle. And I'm joining in. No! If you feel led of the Spirit of God, and the Spirit says join in the battle with the warlord, then it's a Spirit-led battle. I'm just saying, be very careful. Be Spirit-led. Some of you are in a casualties right now in other people's battles because you weren't you know, you didn't, the Holy Spirit didn't tell you to go, and you went. Anyway, I don't know why we, but I'm talking about Ephesians. So I'm saying, you have to understand the battles. So here, we are told about the full armor, everything. So now let's go to 2 Peter. Oh, help me, Jesus. Is this helping somebody? Amen. Amen. Am I correct, Reverend Pauline? Yeah. Hmm. Because, you know, I'm just saying, because sometimes people think, Oh, yeah, just talking because you have the platform. I'm just telling you the truth here. You know, it has helped me a lot. Oh, my God. And it has given me peace. The past is all understanding. Amen. Oh, my God. I t I've spent less time stressing. And I, find, I found that those prayers that I used to do were actually more stress and stressful than actually praying in faith. They were not really faith-filled prayers. There were more prayers like, oh, just fighting, oh, devil this. And there were more devil-minded prayers 
than they were faith-filled prayers. Because what the devil, and all you do when you're talking with everyone, oh, the devil, it was busy, I was busy fighting the devil. And instead of busy talking about God, you're busy promoting the devil all day long. You know, I'm telling you, it's devil this, devil that. Devil, you're devil-minded instead of, instead of being God-minded. That's, for me, that's what it was anyway. So I thank God that he changed that for me. Total renewal of my mind. Hallelujah. Amen. Mm. Second Peter, let's quickly go there. So Second Peter 1 through today, pay attention because this will help you. Second Peter 1, verse 3 and 4. For his divine power has bestowed upon us all things that are requisite and suited to life and godliness through the full personal knowledge of him who called us by and to his own glory and excellence of virtue. By means of these, he has bestowed on us his precious and exceedingly great promises so that through them you may escape by flight from the moral decay, rottenness, and corruption that is in the world because of covetousness, lust, and greed and become sharers, partakers of the divine nature. Mm. For his divine power has bestowed upon us all things that are requisite and suited to life. Listen to this one. Everything we could ever need for life and godliness has already been deposited in us by his divine power. So in the Old Testament, they had to go in and possess the land. For us, God is he's already given it to us because of his grace. He's now saying, here, I've already given it to you. You don't have to actually go in to do battle, to do that kind of warfare. Well, it's there. I've given it to you. How are you hearing? All you have to do is possess it by faith. It is there. It was. It says everything we could ever need for life and godliness has already been deposited in us by his divine power. For all this was lavished upon us through the rich experience of knowing him who has called us by name and invited us to come to him through a glorious manifestation of his goodness. As a result of this, he has given you magnificent promises that are beyond all price so that through the power of these tremendous promises, we can experience partnership with the divine nature by which you have escaped the corrupt desires that are of the world. Mm, this is so powerful. Let me tell you. So what is this saying? Peter here is saying that everything we need in this life, in this dispensation, it comes through knowledge, through the knowledge of God, through knowing God. So in the Old Testament, he gave them the land and he said, there it is. I've given you the land. Go in and possess it. They could see it. Us, God has already given it to us, but it is already deposited in us. It is already in us by his divine power. He's given it to us. All we need, what Peter is saying is everything we need, it comes through knowledge, through knowing him, through knowing him. Because Jesus has already given us everything we could ever need. The day you and I accepted Jesus as our Lord and our Savior, the day you became born again, the day you confessed Romans 10, 9 through 10, you confessed Jesus with your mouth. You accepted him in your heart. That moment, that moment, Jesus then deposited, God deposited everything that you and I will ever need in this life. You he, he, he accepted it. You and I don't need to get something new. That's why I was saying those kind of prayers where, Lord, give me something new. No, what new? You already have everything you need. You just need revelation of what you already have in Amen. Jesus Christ. Amen. That's what you need. You need revelation. Faith is already present because even in 2 Corinthians 5, it tells us that we all have the measure of faith. The day we became a new creature, we received the measure of faith. You see, all, you know, the old has gone, the new has come. And when the new has come, at that moment, we each received the measure of faith. Now, whether you've done something with your faith or not, that's on you. But all of us, we received the same measure of faith at the moment we became born again. So faith is already present, but we just need to learn how to use what we have. 
Yes. Amen. So it's a question of you learning how to use it. If somebody gives you a new car, but you don't know how to drive, you can't say, I don't have transport. No, you do. You just don't know how to drive. Mm -hmm. yeah. You can't lie and say, I don't have transport. Hey, me, I can't get to places because I don't have a ride. That's a lie from the pit of hell. You do have a right. You just don't know how to drive. There's a difference. Mm -hmm. You know, people will say that. Oh, I don't have a right. Uh, okay. But then I come to your car. But you have a car here. You have keys. It's a brand new car. Yeah. Oh, but you, so you have a right. Yes, but I don't know how to drive. So that's a different thing. Mm -hmm. You see? So, but we say that. We say that about the things of God. Oh, I don't have it. No, you have it. You just don't know how to access it. Mm -hmm. We have everything we need, people of God. We just maybe don't know yet how to access it. But faith, faith is present. You may not have just done anything. You may not have exercised your faith. You probably don't know how to exercise your faith to access this which God has already deposited in us. Amen. 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 Prosperity is already given. We just need to learn the laws that govern prosperity, you know, kingdom prosperity, and cooperate with those laws. So you can't say, oh, but for me, you know, uh, this poverty, uh, don't call it. You know, poverty is a spirit. It has ears to hear. You know, spirits, they move. Demons, they're spirit, they're demons. So don't call it poverty to your house. Don't invite it. Eh, this poverty that's coming, eh, me, I don't call it, I reject it. Poverty is not my portion. But don't call it and speak about it and invite it. It has ears. You call it, you know, it's like, you, you, we have to, the things we do in the natural, think about it. You have a child. Isaac! What am I doing? Calling, calling him. Uh -huh. So, wherever, even if I'm talking, let's say I'm talking to Minister Eva. Hey, this Isaac, if Isaac was over there, what is Isaac saying? When I just mentioned, I'm, we're just having a conversation. I'm saying, hey, you know, today Isaac was doing whatever, whatever. And Isaac is playing over there. If he, if he hears me mention his name, what does a child do? He'll say, oh, you called me, ma? Because he heard me do what? Mention his name. I didn't call him. I'm just talking about him. But he heard me mention his name. So he'll do what? He will come, right? Mm -hmm. So if I'm just having a conversation and I'm speaking about poverty, what will poverty do? Uh -huh. <laughs> Think about those things when you're having conversations. Mm. Don't just be mentioning things you don't want to come into your life. So me, poverty, I command you to go. Look, go far, far away. I release the fire of God upon you. Lack, I command you to go. You are not the will of God for my life. Poverty, you are not the will of God for my life. Go far, far, far away. I release the fire of God upon you. Stay far away from me, my household, my family, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You don't mention those things you don't want. Don't call them. Because your, you, 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 your mouth has power. Your voice has power. Right. You release words. You, uh, you, you, you have power. When you say something, you are, you've been made in the image of God. Your voice is like an activator. You activate things just like God activated. You have a voice that activates. When God spoke, he spoke things into being. Right. When you speak, you speak things into being. So when you say things you don't want, you call them into being. Right. So don't call things you don't want. Yes. Mm -hmm. So prosperity is already given. Amen. So you just need to learn the laws that govern kingdom prosperity and cooperate with them. Healing has already been deposited on the inside of us. You and I have the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead. We don't need any more power. Oh, Lord, all night long you're praying for power. Oh, Lord, give us power. Give us power, Lord. What power? He says, I've given you authority. I've given you power to trample over serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. What more power do you need? Huh? But now, let's pray. This prayer point, this prayer point, we're going to ask the Lord in the name of Jesus. To, Father, we need power. We need power. What power? And now, everybody, in the name of Jesus, power. Father, give me power. Give me power. Give me power. And you're spending 15, 20 minutes. People are coming there with handkerchiefs, wiping, you know. 
because you want power. And yet Jesus has already given you power. What more power? This is what I'm talking about, people. Lack of knowledge. Lack of knowledge. Come on. Just acknowledge the power that you already have and learn to use it. You haven't used the one you've got, but you want more. Come on. Is the truth all right? Yes. So the knowledge of God, that God, the knowledge of God that he has already given us, according to what Peter is saying here, you know, um, gives, uh, gives us access to all the promises in the word for the purpose of allowing us to partake of his divine nature. So when we have knowledge of God, okay, this knowledge of who God is, it gives us, and, and this knowledge that God has given us, it gives us access to his promises in the word for the purpose of allowing us to partake of his divine nature. This is a great deal. You understand? Yes. Now, when we look at this verse, and it's taking us to where we're going now, this verse says, though, <coughs> excuse me, by means of these, the promises, he has bestowed on us his precious and exceedingly great promises, okay, so that through them you may escape by flight the moral decay, the rottenness and corruption that is in the world because of covetousness, lust and greed, and become sharers, partakers of the divine nature. So the corruption, we find that there's a problem. He's talking about escape. He's talking about corruption. He's talking about lust or covetousness there. So the corruption that is in the world. Remember, we are in the world, and there's corruption that is in the world through lust. So there's this corruption that is in the world. First, he's telling us about escape, but let's talk about the corruption that is in the world through lust. This corruption in the world through lust is continually seeking to conform us to its image, okay? It's continually to, it's, it's a moral decay. The Bible says here, we're told that these promises, exceedingly great promises, because by the means of these promises that God has given us, it's for us to be able to escape the corruption, okay? The moral decay, the rottenness that is in the world, okay? So that, it, we, so that we are not conforming to the world, the image of the world. Now, and then there's also not only just the corruption, but also because of the lust, because of the lust and the greed. If you look at the world, there's lust, there's greed in the world. This English word lust here, it is was translated from a Greek word that means a longing for something that is forbidden, and you can see it in the world. There is a longing for things that are forbidden. Look at, look at the ads that come on the TV now. It's things that are forbidden, and that's what movies now. What are they showing? Things that are forbidden. When, when you look at the Word of God, it's forbidden, but they are doing it in the movies. Exactly that. So it's the lust that's in the world. There aren't many forces, like I said last week, that are drawing you towards holiness. Most of them are drawing you into a different direction. And so this is saying that there's, a corrupt, there's corruption in the world, but what is the antidote to corruption in the world? It's the promises of God. So instead of you conforming to that, you need to conform to the promises of God. By these, that by these great promises, you may escape. Having escaped. Now, escape would imply, it says, escape by flight. Escape by flight. Escaping by flight would imply that there's some kind of bondage there. Something that is holding you captive. Escaping the corruption that is in the world is an action of the mind. Okay? Escaping the corruption that is in the world. I would say that... Right now, with what has happened from 2019 to now, that's still happening right now, especially with this virus pandemic, you need, it's a corruption that the devil is doing. And you need an escape by flight. Is the truth all right? Mm -hmm. Escaping this corruption that is in the world. And what the Bible here is saying is escaping the corruption that is in the world, an action of the mind meaning latching on to the promises of God rather than being conformed to the thoughts 
and philosophies of the world. You see, there's probably no area of our lives that is more attacked than the mind. I'm telling you, people of God, there is no area. That's why I started off with Ephesians explaining all that. Because in Ephesians, it's telling us about when you're actually going on the battlefront. And you're actually physically in the war. This is when you're actually on the war front, on the ground. And this is what you're wearing. These are the physical, you know, physical now. You're doing the whoa, 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 slashing in the spirit. That's why he talks about, finishes off in verse 18 in Ephesians, praying in the spirit. So you're now slicing. You're doing that. You're using every piece of armor in Ephesians. That's the warfare. So now, let's go to Romans 12. Real quickly. Is this blessing you people? Yeah. Romans 12, verse 2. First of all, let's see. Verse 1, let's quickly just say that. Read that. I like that. But really, my verse is verse 2, but I just like verse 1 as well. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, and beg of you in view of all the mercies of God to make a decisive dedication of your bodies, presenting all, all your members, all of them, including your mind, and faculties as a living sacrifice, holy, devoted, consecrated, and well-pleasing to God, which is your reasonable, rational, and intelligent and service, service and spiritual worship. So why I like one is because you can't separate the mind from everything else. So sometimes you say, oh Lord, I give you my body, but you don't want, you take your mind away. And you say, Lord, I worship you, I give you my whole self. Most of the times, you know, you are a worshiper, she'll tell me, Miss, uh, Reverend Pauline, when people worship, when they come and worship, most of the time, they're saying, Lord, I give you, even the songs, we say, Lord, I give you myself. I mean, you know the songs, I don't really, you know, I like to sing them, but I forget the words. But we will cry out there, we're saying, Lord, I really, truly give you all of me. We are really giving our bodies, right? We're saying, I give you like what is here. We're, we're saying, God, I, I'm throwing myself there to you. But I can guarantee you 100%, correct me if I'm wrong. We are giving our bodies, but usually we keep our minds. I guarantee you that. We say, God, I've given you my whole self, but I'll have kept my mind. Hmm. Verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, this age fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs, but be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind, by its new ideals and its new attitudes, so that you may prove for yourselves what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God, even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. So why I said that is because there's no way that Apostle Paul, by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, would write about begging us of our bodies and then talking about the mind in the second verse. It's because because he knows that, okay, I begged you about your bodies, but then I know you've left out something. You didn't give God everything. You left out your mind. So don't be conformed to this world. In other words, the will of God, like here he said, do not be conformed to this world. This is, this is a commandment. This is not something that is just passive. Oh, don't be conformed. No, it is a commandment from the Lord. Do not be conformed to this world, this age, this age, this age. I repeat that, this age, this age, all oh, this one that is happening out there, green hair, blue hair, purple, whatever, whatever. I'm just saying, um, husband, husband, wife, wife, uh, this age, I'm just saying, is it is the truth all right? Mm -hmm. eh? Oh, and I, I and I, I now pronounce you husband, husband. At this age, mm, mm, mm. Mm. do not be conformed. Come on. Yeah, you understand? Mm. Oh, this is my husband. Uh, 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 my husband said, and you have, uh, your husband, you have, uh, do not be conformed mm. to this age. A man shall leave his mother and father and shall cleave to a wife. I'm just saying. What did the Bible say? I'm just saying. This age. Do not be conformed to this age, fashioned after, adapted to its external superficial customs. This age, uh, no, it's not a baby, it's a fetus. This age, I'm just saying, is the truth all right? Amen. I'm just saying, the Bible is very clear. Do not be conformed. Oh, but a pastor, it's a woman's right. Do not be conformed to this age fashioned after and adapted to its external superficial customs 
If, oh, you know, I like amplified. <laughs> amplified is real. But be transformed, changed by the entire renewal of your mind, by its new ideals and its new attitude, so that you may prove for yourselves, you may prove for yourselves what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Even the thing which is good and acceptable and perfect in his sight for you. In other words, the will of God is good, acceptable, and perfect. But you cannot prove that in your own life if your mind is not renewed. If your mind is not renewed, transformed, changed by the, renew, the entire renewal of your mind. You cannot prove that. You cannot prove that, the, that it's good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Oh, I pray for the perfect will of God to be done in my life. You cannot prove that if your mind is not renewed. Period. Pray for me for the perfect will of God to be done in my life. You cannot prove that for yourself. It cannot happen. Period. Full stop. Is the truth all right? Yes. People of God, before you send me daggers, the word is the word, and it is true. Hmm? Do not be conformed, so that you may prove for yourselves what is the good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. So here I'm saying, we are all together here. Pray for me for the perfect will of God to be done in my life. Hmm. How is, how is the perfect will of God going to be done if your mind is not renewed? The entire renewal of your mind. I'm just saying, is the truth all right? Amen. Hmm. So, what is that saying? Do not be conformed to this world, but be transfigured, transformed by the renewing of your mind. Now, conforming to this world is also a mental activity. The world wants to conform you to its image. It wants to pound you into its shape. It wants to mold you. It wants to infiltrate your thought life. It wants to brainwash you into whatever is out there that you're allowing into your thought life. And so the world is going to talk about you, you know, talk to you about all kinds of things and shape your belief system based upon the culture of the moment rather than based upon the truth of God's word. The moment you turn on your television, the moment you turn on any electronic device or system, you become bombarded with thoughts, thoughts that have a goal, okay? Whether the person that's putting forth the thoughts knows this or not. That's why you need to be mindful about what you allow to come through your phones, your whatever, especially your phones. You know, with this now, WhatsApp and all these messaging things, you need to be careful. You know, for me, I'm very careful, like, especially when I'm about to minister, I don't read texts because people will just send you stuff. And, oh God, people don't even care what, oh, this is, somebody's about to minister. They send you something about somebody's funeral who you don't even know and they're showing you the person in the casket with their stomach wide open. I don't care about that. Why would I need to see that? I'm about to minister. They, they have no school that, oh, the, this is a Sunday, somebody's ministering, or they, somebody starts telling you their download about some issue they had with some boyfriend somewhere. I'm about to minister, come on. Do you not think, oh, this is a, a ministering. Did you not see my emails all over ministry? I have a meeting, I have a meeting, hello, I'm ministering. And now you're giving me your download about some guy, some dude who did something to you. Come on, can you not wait until Monday? You know, I mean, but you know, people will just send you, or they'll send you somebody in a country somewhere you don't even live, you don't even know they had an accident and 50 people died and kids were decapitated. What am I gonna do with that? You know, I'm like, you know, so, I mean, and some people are just good people, well-meaning, they're just passing things. Oh, they saw a video. That's why you need to be, you need to have the spirit of discernment. Don't open everything. Just because people post stuff on Facebook, you don't need to watch everything. You know, they may be your friends, yeah, but ask the Holy Spirit, do I need to watch this? Some things you just pass by, 
pass along. Say hello and pass along. Some things even that come through your WhatsApp, not everything. And I mean, for me, people know, like, let me say, but she, she censors things. She knows which ones to send me. And there are many things she will not send me. Very many things she knows. And weeks later, she'll be like, oh, one day there was this thing that I saw. And I was like, okay, I can't send it to Apostle this week. Apostle is busy. Uh, somebody sent me this and, you know, I couldn't send it to you because I know you were preparing for ministry. I didn't want to talk to you about this, but somebody's, oh, yeah, people send her a lot of stuff. And she knows what to send me. And even text messages, she knows which ones to forward to me and which ones not to. She will censor them. Okay, this one, mm -mm. this one, no. I'm the one who's going to be shouted at, so I'm not even going to send it. But I'm telling you, you have to know which ones. You know, you can't just, even just for yourself. You don't just, oh, you know you're about to pray. Then, oh, let me answer the phone. You know this person is going to take, you know, turn off some buttons. Don't answer. Just don't answer. Turn off the phone. Pray and then later on call them. I'm just saying, use wisdom. That's why wisdom is there. The Bible says, if any man likes wisdom, let him ask of God. Don't just do things. Because you know what? The devil knows when to attack your mind. I'm just saying. This is what this is talking about here. And so, we're talking about, you know, the don't be, you know, here Apostle Paul is saying don't be conformed. You have to actively not allow yourself to be conformed to this world. Nobody's going to do it for you. Oh, pray for me so that my mind is not conformed to the world. Really? I'm not with you 24 hours. You know, you need to do that. Do not be conformed. That's a, you know, mandate for you to do, you know. And so the world will talk to you. You're there on your jobs. The world is talking to you as you're walking. The world is talking to you. The radio is talking to you. The store is talking to you. The billboards are talking to you. Wherever you go, things are talking to you. Even in the store, food is talking to you. I'm telling you, all sorts of things are talking to you to shape your belief system based upon the culture of the moment. You understand? So that. You don't follow the truth that is in the word of God. Yes. Okay? And these things are putting thoughts, forth thoughts, whether you know it or not. And so you need to understand that there's a spiritual force behind all of this. And it's the spirit of Antichrist that is trying to conform us into this image so that we can reject the truth. And so people are sitting there right now questioning. Uh, okay, I know that the Bible says this, but I think. And people right now in the body of Christ... They're saying, well, I know the Bible says this, but this says this, and this is... I'm telling you, people are actually having little conversations in their own heads, debating with the Word of God. Well, I mean, they're saying this is good, and this, this, does this. Well, I know what the Bible says, but this, this, this. I'm telling you. Oh, but you know, like you did this here, and you did that. Well, I know what the Bible says, but this says this. Come on! That's the spirit of Antichrist right there. It has entered... Oh, we, we are waiting. When the Antichrist comes, we are going, really? He's already been. <laughs> it has already been. Where have you been? <laughs> so we need to understand that our minds are a battleground, a battlefield in which the enemy is continually coming against us. You know, you've got to watch these things. That's why in the body of Christ, sometimes you have weird dreams. Have you all got weird dreams? Do you get weird dreams? Yeah. Weird dreams, some kind of tragedy you see in a dream, mm -hmm. or some kind of fear. We've had, all had those dreams, mm -hmm. you know, because the mind is the battlefield. Sometimes you see relatives and dream, oh, I had my relative in my dream. Mm -hmm. But who did this? Oh, this putting fear in you. Take authority. You don't go to bed before you decree and declare. Psalm 91 over yourself. You take authority over your mind. You know your mind is a battlefield. How do you just throw yourself in bed? Just going to sleep. Eh, I'm tired. Eh, eh. It's the day I work so hard. Just going to sleep. You know you're giving access to the devil. Who in the body of Christ goes to bed without pleading the blood of Jesus over their mind before they go to sleep? Putting, you know, oh my God, you cannot. Um, you don't go to bed without anointing your mind. You don't go to bed without decreeing and declaring Psalm 91 over yourself, over your household, over your children, over your family. You don't go to bed without pleading the blood of Jesus, binding your mind to the mind of Jesus Christ.
so that you have spirit-led dreams. Mm. Hi. Mm -hmm. Who goes to bed? Hey, I'm tired. After you've been watching 911 or police, whatever, whatever, and news, they've put all this stuff in your head and you go to sleep. And then you wake up. Hey, these tigers, they were chasing me in the dream. And spirit of fear has entered you. And spirit of fear, the Bible said, the spirit of fear torments. And now you'll be tormented and then you have sickness and disease out of nowhere that is tormenting and doctors can't find the problem. And you're wondering why you've got all these weird sicknesses. Yet, you went to sleep after watching whatever on TV that put fear in you. Hey, people. Wisdom. You don't, I'm not saying don't watch your weird things. Watch them. Watch them if you want. That's your prerogative. But I'm just saying, don't go to bed without praying. Hey, I prayed. What did you pray? Lord, as I got to sleep, I don't... <laughs> whatever. Really? Really? You are playing in this age. In this age? <laughs> did you see what he said? Do not. Be conformed to this world, this age. <laughs> so, we've got to be continually aware of what is trying to take place in our minds. Continually. So, this attack that the enemy comes with, it can be overt or it can be subtle. It can be visible or it can be invisible. So, what's the answer? Quickly, let's go to 2 Corinthians 10. Is this helping you? Yes. All right, 2 Corinthians 10. Because if it's not, tell me, I can stop. And we can all go home. No, for real, if it's not helping you, tell me. I want it to help you. So, 2 Corinthians 10. Now, this is where, really, this is where I wanted to get and we'll close after I finish this, this portion. So 2 Corinthians 10 is where I really wanted to get to when I started talking about Ephesians. So people mix up these two, okay? Because 2 Corinthians 10, verse 4 and 5, it also mentions, verse 4, it mentions weapons. So a lot of times people mix these weapons and those weapons. Now these weapons here, it's also warfare, but these are specific. It's not the Ephesians. The Ephesians ones cover... The whole body, that's why I said. But this is also spiritual warfare. But listen, let's read 4 and 5. For the weapons of our warfare are not physical weapons of flesh and blood, similar to Ephesians, okay? Mm -hmm. But they are mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. Inasmuch as we refute arguments and theories and reasonings, and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. And we lead every thought and purpose away captive into the obedience of Christ the Messiah, the anointed one. Let me read it um, from the other uh, translation here. For although we live in the natural realm, we don't wage a military campaign employing human weapons, using manipulation to achieve our aims. Instead, our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to effectively dismantle the defenses behind which people hide. We can demolish every deceptive fantasy that opposes God and break through every arrogant attitude that is raised up in defiance of the true knowledge of God. We capture like prisoners of war every thought and insist that it bow in, in obedience to the anointed one. So this is where I want to tell you that a lot of people in the body of Christ, they use this one, um, verse 4, as they use Ephesians 6.12. So many times they'll mix the two. And they'll start using this to fight the physical. Uh, when Apostle Paul says we don't fight flesh, we're fighting that warfare where we're using the full body armor on that one. And they're using that one. Oh, what's that, Kasia? Yeah, we're doing tearing down these strongholds. Uh, this one is specific, though. The strongholds, it actually tells us what these strongholds are. It tells us that we are using the weapons that we are using here for our warfare here. They're not physical. They are mighty. Okay, for the overthrow and destruction of strongholds. Now, it's to tear down strongholds. And we are told exactly what these strongholds are. 
So that's the thing we have to look for. When we read these things, we must be very careful. So first, before we go to what they are, what is a stronghold? The Bible, uh, Bible dictionary, no. The online Merriam-Webster dictionary uh, describes a stronghold as a fortified place, a fortified place, okay? And so Apostle Paul, though, he lets us know what these strongholds are. He says we tear down these strongholds. These strongholds, he, he says... These are the tearing, and as much as we refute arguments and theories and reasonings and every proud and lofty thing that sets itself up against the true knowledge of God. And other translations, I think, in King James, it might say casting down, casting down, you know, whatever, lie. lies. It's lies. The strongholds are lies. Bringing every thought into conformity with truth. This is what it is. These are lies. Whatever these lies are, the strongholds here are lies. You understand what I'm saying? That's what it is. The strongholds. Lofty thing. The theories, in as much as we refute arguments and theories. So, when I read the other translation, for though we live in the natural realm, we don't wage a military campaign employing human weapons, using manipulation to achieve our aims. Instead, our spiritual weapons are energized with divine power to effectively dismantle the defenses between which behind which people hide what is that lies mm -hmm. the defenses which people hide is lies you know if i'm hiding behind something that means i'm lying so that stronghold there is lies that's that that's what that means the destruction of strongholds they are for the they are mighty before God for the overthrow and destruction of lies. You understand? So that's why I said people mix it up. So when they're saying using this in Ephesians 6, they're actually not with Ephesians 6, they're actually not being effective in their prayer. Because here they're not actually dealing with the lies. You know, so you're bring you're praying. You are praying against principality. You understand? Are you understanding where I'm coming from now when I was starting off with Ephesians 6? Mm -hmm. you're, bringing, you're trying to bring down a principality, which is a demon of something else. Mm -hmm. But here, you're using this one, and you're saying, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, you stronghold, you principality. But it's a lie. You understand? Mm -hmm. You're supposed to be bringing, tearing down a lie. You, you're calling on a demon, demon. You see where I'm going here? Yes. So how is that prayer going to be effective? And then them, the demons, they're looking at you like, huh? I'm just saying. <laughs> you understand why I'm saying lack of knowledge when God says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So now, when you're going, say, think about it now in the natural. If I go to somebody's camp, eh, and I'm going there and I'm starting a fight, don't you think they'll retaliate? That's why we have casualties in the body of Christ. They will fight me because I went and started a fight that wasn't supposed to be started. And I was supposed to be fighting lies, doing something else. And that the weapon that I had was for the lies, but me, I didn't go with the other weapons to fight that principality. I went with the weapons for the lies. Now this one will bamboozle me. Because I didn't go with the correct weapons. Do you understand my point? Yeah. That's why I was saying with spiritual warfare, a lot of people don't understand it. I'm just saying. So we'll leave that one alone. Now you understand. Okay. okay. So Apostle Paul here, he lets us know that whatever these lies are. So basically, first of all, tearing down strongholds, the destruction, the overthrow and, tear and destruction of strongholds means tearing down strongholds. These strongholds are lies. Which means bringing every thought, the thought, every thought into conformity with the truth, which is the word of God. So Apostle Paul, he is letting us know that whatever these lies are, and we'll talk about them. I'll tell you what most of them are. Whatever these lies are, they are so reinforced and resistant that they can only be eradicated by the power of God and the weapons supplied by the Holy Spirit. So when we look at fort, a fortified place, think about like in these, especially like when I think about like in Europe, that's where you find like all these castles and 
places like that that they've built you know war even when you think of war places where you have um you know it's fortified even like right now if you go to like an a base an army base it's fortified you can't really get in and stuff like that and so this is what apostle paul is trying to tell us here that it's a place where either you can't get in or you can't get out you know while the people in can get out but you, you can't get in if you're trying to break in okay so think about that the word stronghold comes from the greek word or choruma choruma you know so this part i had to study it out so i'm not giving you stuff like i'm just like brainy like that i am brainy like that but anyway <laughs> i did study <laughs> so let me tell you what i what from what i studied what it said so it is one of the oldest words in the new testament originally used to describe the fortified place it depicted a fortress a castle or a citadel ancient fortresses had exceptionally thick very high impregnable walls that were designed to keep outsiders from scaling the walls or from breaking inside. Such walls were intended to keep intruders outside. And this same Greek word, although spelt a little differently, is the same one used in the New Testament to describe a prison. And since the most secure, highly guarded prisons were usually constructed deep inside such fortresses, it makes sense that the word for a fortress or stronghold is the same identical Greek word used to picture a prison. Whereas a fortress keeps outsiders from getting in, a, pri a prison keeps insiders from getting out. Prisons are places of detention or holding tanks. They also have fortified walls as well as bars of steel that are designed to hold a prisoner in captivity. Okay, so. This is the part that I studied. And so when I, I sat there and I was now thinking through, when we do these prayer points a lot in our minds, we say, okay, so remember, remember in, in Peter, we talked about escaping. So many of us, when we pray prayers, we're talking about captivity. We are talking about, you know, the prisons. Oh, I want to get out of this prison. Many right now in your minds, you're either in a prison or you are in a fort in a fortress. So I want you to be because there's a deliverance coming. So um, your mindset right now, you are either in a fortified place, or you're in a prison. Based on what I've explained here. So the strongholds Apostle Paul is referring to here. So did you get these? This this what I explained yes. that the lies are so reinforced and resistant that they can only be eradicated by the power of God, okay? Mm -hmm. And so um, the stronghold, uh, or, uh, this stronghold comes from, it's a fortified place, you know, um, they've got, you know, you can't really, it keeps outsiders from getting in or breaking inside. And then a prison, a prison, a places of detention or holding tanks, okay? So think about that in maybe where you are right now in your minds. So Apostle Paul is referring um, to here in, in verse 4 and 5, he's referring uh, to lies that are the devil has ingrained so deeply in your mind and in your belief system that they now exert power over certain areas of your life. Think about ancient rulers. You know, ancient rulers liked to build castles and when they built these castles they would perch high on a mountainside even i think in the bible you'd find oh the king lived high on a mountain you know even like places like in europe you'll find that's where castles are they live high up on a mountain side well the and they they would live high on a mountain so they could overlook like the village or the cities well this is what the devil likes to do he attempts to build you know he wants to build a stronghold um, strong lies in your mind so that he can rule you from a lofty position in your thoughts and in your emotions. So he builds this stronghold. Now, although you may know logically that these lies, the enemy speaks to your mind, are untrue, these lies still wage war in your soul. And these lies are attempting to sabotage your sense of self-worth 
and self-image. Now, in biblical counseling, when we do, like when I do biblical counseling, basically what it is is getting down to the very rock bottom of exposing the lies that you have believed and helping you to have the opportunity to believe the truth. And that's what we call repentance. And it's called turning from the lie and embracing the truth. That's really basically what counseling is, spiritual counseling. Now you can do this with yourself, but exposing the lies that you have believed about God, things you have believed about yourself, things you have believed about others, and recognizing those, being brutally honest with yourself, because if what you think isn't in line with God's word, then you're thinking wrong. Then you're the one with the problem. And the more you think wrong, the more those lies are going to continue to produce their fruit, and that fruit has seeds. And you're going to begin sowing those seeds of those lies into other people, and this thing keeps going. So the answer is to tear down these strongholds or these lies. Now, when a person has a stronghold in their mind or in their emotions, they have thick, invisible walls around them that act like both a fortress and a prison in their life. Like the walls of a fortress, these lies insulate them from people who may try to break in to help them to see the truth. And although others may try to help this person, they often find it impossible to break through those invisible barriers that surround their mind and their emotions. Now, as a result, the person under mental and emotional assault is held captive like a prisoner to those lies. And they'll sit behind mental and emotional bars, viewing their life through the illusion of bondage that Satan has put into their mind. And they'll look at others, sadly, wishing they could be free from those bars, not realizing that they've already been set free by the blood of Jesus Christ. So the lies that operate in that person's soul keep them bound in an inner prison that they can't seem to break out of by themselves. Now, these strongholds, where do they come from? Okay, this is the question. Where do they come from? Well, they come from culture, cultural strongholds, traditional things that we may have grown up believing. You know, we have family culture, things that our family taught us and has instilled in us. You know, this is the way we do things. You know, and then, yeah, but they don't do that. Well, it doesn't matter. This is how we've always done it, and this is how we do it. You know, we even have religious strongholds. Well, this is the way our church does it. You know, we've always believed it this way, and this is the way we've always done it. So we have all kinds of strongholds that have been put into us that have to be torn down. We're being told all kinds of lies, which have also to be torn down. And tearing these down, you know, when we talk about biblical counseling, what are we doing? What we're doing is getting into a situation in which a person is willing to have revealed to them the lies that they have believed. We have the cultural lies. We have the religious lies. We have the family lies. We have the strongholds that we have believed. Uh, you know, um, I remember like in the religious, the religious lies. Um, we, I went somewhere, my husband and I, Minister Ava went to visit, we were 
for a season. There was somewhere where the Lord had us visiting when we moved out here. Um, and um, uh, as I, I asked the Lord, I said, why are we visiting this place? It has, you know, has nothing to do with really what we're doing. But there was a reason why the Lord had us there. And so while we're, the few weeks we're visiting, I noticed that there was a spirit of sickness in this you know, huge, big place where people were coming and people loved coming there and people were fun, and, you know, nice people, everything. But man, there was like a cancer had overtaken the place. People had cancer and it was like something they were just talking about like casually. Oh, my cancer, my cancer, my cancer. I'm like, what, what? So for me, that wasn't my space. Like, uh, no, we, we don't claim it like that. But these people were just like as if they're just passing each other donuts. Like, my cancer, oh yeah, my cancer, my cancer. Oh, oh. So it started bothering me, like hearing them, you know, talk about that. And so one day I'm like, Lord, that's not right. And nobody was praying about it uh, that I knew of. Um, so I felt led by the Spirit of God to reach out to the pastor. And so I wrote an email and I said, okay, I'm finding that there's this, is there somewhere where people pray about their cancer and stuff like that. And so he directed me to somebody who was over things like that, another pastor, to talk with them. And I was gladly, you know, I gladly made an appointment and went and met this person. And we sat down, we talked, I explained to them what I do. And I said, you know, I haven't seen, is there, you know, like a prayer group somewhere or whatever? And they were like, well, yeah, we have like a wall where people put prayer requests. I said, oh, okay, that would be nice. I'd love to pray there and stuff. And he's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I said, okay, but why is there like no altar call at the end? Because it seems like there are a whole lot of people who have this demon of sickness on them. Why don't you have an altar call at the end so people can be prayed over before they leave? And so he's like, oh, oh that would be so hard to do. I said, why? I mean, you have a service at the end and just have people come and somebody pray. I said, I'll be glad to, you know, I mean, the idea is mine. I'll be glad to offer to be there and pray for all the services, you know, for only having like two services at the time. I'm like, right now, I'm not really, on Sundays, I'm not really doing anything. So I'll be glad to pray, really, for the people. It's not a problem. I don't need to know them. I don't need their names or anything. I just need to lay hands on them and cast that thing out. Like, really, the anointing is just like, <laughs> I just want to do it. And the guy said to me, well, I don't know how that will fit into our program because we are just pointing people to Jesus. I don't know how healing will fit into that. Mm. Hmm. Jesus had a healing ministry. And you don't know how that healing will fit into you pointing people to Jesus? Yeah, okay. So I went to the Lord. I said, okay, I don't know why we're here, Lord. Something is wrong. Because the people have their cancers and they're passing it to each other. And I mean, I literally went and joined some groups and, and the people, we, Minister Eva and I, we joined some women's groups to try and see if, okay, through there, maybe we could pray for people. Man, when we, I prayed, they looked at me weird. Like, what is she doing? They would enjoy talking about how they had their cancers. And I'll be like, okay, can I pray? And they're like, okay, yeah, sure. And I would pray to cast out those demons. And everybody would be quiet and not say anything. And when we said amen at the end, it was like weird. That why would you pray like that? For them, it was like, why are you praying against it? And then they would celebrate when somebody died. We were like, out of there, quick. Like, okay, we got to go. I said, Lord, are you releasing us? And he released us. I said, okay. He needed us to see something, and he needed to show us why we needed to be in the area. Because the people were dying of cancer. I said, Jesus. And they celebrated it like they're having tea with donuts. I'm like, oh my God. Oh my God. Lack of knowledge. I'm just saying, religious stuff. Because at our church, the fact that you can't implement prayer for people who are dying, left, right, and center, because you don't know how it will fit with the vision because our vision is just to point people to Jesus. Well, but if you read the Gospels, Jesus prayed for people everywhere, healing, 
How does healing not fit in that? My point is religious cultures, strongholds, lies, lies, things like that. So what is it in your culture that they told you growing up? You can't do this. Don't touch that. If you touch that and you've grown up and now you're afraid. Oh, but in my culture, you, you were in Africa, you were in America. Come on. <laughs> you're afraid to touch it because uh, them there in Africa, how are they going to see you touching it in America? <laughs> I've had that in counseling some people. Oh, but if my people knew, how are they going to see you from Africa? <laughs> Bondage. Huh? Because this is what I'm talking about, lies. And these some of these things, especially us in Africa, traditional stuff, my God, has put people in bondage, strongholds. And people are failing to break through. They're here in America failing to break through into business, break through in careers, break through in marriages because of the bondage that they were putting back then. I heard a lady saying that, you know, her husband died and people expected her to wear black the whole year. Why? Why? Tradition. Because it's tradition in Africa, you have to wear black the whole year. Why? Who says so? Where in the Bible did she say? They, they say you have to wear black the whole year. If she wants to wear blue, if she wants to wear pink, why can't she wear that? Oh, if I wear that, the people say, oh, but her husband, eh, read the Bible. Where does it say? Where? Huh? Oh, because she, hmm, the Bible has a period of mourning, and then after that, you're free. Till death do us part. Why are you putting somebody in bondage for five years? Come on. Stop that. It's not in the Bible. Lies. It's not in the Bible. Oh, if the person wants to leave the house after two weeks, after the husband has died, let her go to the store. If she goes to, hey, if the people in my country heard that I went to shopping, they will, oh, really? Oh, bondage. Bondage. Lies, lies, lies. We need to tear those strongholds down. That's why people can't succeed. You are in America for donkey years and you're failing to succeed because of the lies from the bondage from your tradition. Lies need to be torn down. In Jesus' name. Amen. Ah, Amen. Especially these African strongholds. Hey, we break them. In Jesus' name. Break them. Break them. Break them. Me, I refuse these African strongholds to be on my children. I refuse. I never even speak them over my children. I break them. Them. My children are American. They've never I've never spoken any of these African traditions over them. Never, they don't even know them. They don't even understand them. Why? Because they what? They yeah, are African, but they're not gonna live there. I, I highly doubt it. So why should I put them in bondage? Break, broken, broken. Me, even though I was born there, I made sure I broke mine them that my mom and them taught. No, because me, I'm American. I've lived here longer. I don't broken, broken over myself. Broken, broken. I live here. Why am I going to be in bondage over African bondage, whatever? Broken, broken in Jesus' name. Ah, I should be here struggling to make it in America because of being bound by stuff, tra African tradition. What? Come on. No, oh, because in Africa, even when, when my husband and I were trying to get married, all of these relatives, hey, in Africa we do, I'm not in Africa, oh no, I refuse. I refused all the African tradition. Hey, in Africa, hey, I'm not getting married in Africa. I'm in America. The man I met in America, he found me in America. He didn't pluck me from Africa. Hey. <laughs> you want me to do African tradition, what? So I can be in African bondage. No. We do American Bible stuff. We are Bible people. We do Bible stuff. Oh, people were upset. Eh, that's your own, as the Nigerians say. <laughs> we did the Bible stuff, and here we are. No bondage of us. Freedom. Oh, come on. Wanting to put us in African bondage. What is that? Oh, come on. Eh, but you know, eh, you know.
Is it on now? This part is what you needed, so if it's not on, I can't. It's on now? All right. Minister Ava, do you have it on? Yeah. All right, so this part is important. Let me quickly finish with this. So everyone who is hearing me right now, like I said, you're all hearing me upon, based upon your own personal filters that you have. And these filters are called strongholds. They're temporary filters and permanent filters, or strongholds that we all filter information through. The temporary filter is one where you just had a fight with your spouse on your way to church, and so you're all upset and you're, you're not really paying attention, and so that's a filter that you know, the minister, me, has to be able to overcome, you know, as I'm ministering. Because now I can tell that, okay, you're upset or something and you're not paying attention. I have to overcome that filter. The permanent filter is something that has been there. It's the way you believe. And I, you know, it's the way you believe and whatever somebody else is telling you, you don't want, I don't want anybody to mess with this. That's a permanent filter. So, but the temporary one is where somebody has to overcome that because you're dealing with something, a temporary situation. But the permanent ones, the one you have to deal with, because it's, I can't let you, I don't care what you're saying. This is what I believe. Nobody can change that. So when we minister the word of God, the word has got to break down these lies, expose them, and break the filters, tear, tear down the strongholds, everything that is in the way of you being conformed to the word of God. And that's why this thing is huge. Because you can't expect to walk in an overcoming life of faith if you're in a position of complete captivity in your mind. That's why what I started off by saying even with this coronavirus thing, it's so important that you don't allow this to consume your mind. If it consumes your mind, you'll be in complete captivity of your mind and you can't walk in overcoming faith. So when you read 2 Corinthians 10, 4, 5 about stronghold, you need to picture both a fortress and a prison in your mind and then apply this whole picture that I've just shared with you today in, to your own life. Now I want to give you a mini spiritual diagnosis, four questions that you need to ask yourself today as you go home. Number one, are there any areas of your mind that are currently controlled by the enemy's lies of fear, doubt, and worry? I'll repeat that. Are there any areas of your mind that are currently controlled by the enemy's lies of fear, doubt, and worry? Are there any areas of your mind that are currently controlled by the enemy's lies of fear, doubt, and worry? Number two, do you find yourself being repeatedly attacked in the areas of self-worth and self-image? Number two, do you find yourself being repeatedly attacked in the areas of self-worth and self-image? And number three, are these attacks debilitating and crippling? Are these attacks debilitating and crippling? And number four, do you feel like a hostage to these areas of your mind and emotions? Do you feel like a hostage to these areas of your mind and emotions? Now, if you answered yes to any of these questions, 
you have probably allowed the devil to build strongholds in your mind and emotions that are hindering you from stepping out to do something God has purposed for you to do in your life. If that is your situation, first, you need to recognize and repent for permitting strongholds to develop in the first place. Then you'll need to go back and see how the devil gained this foothold in your life. So it's important, you know, I was going to pray, but I can't because you have to find out why and how the devil gained entry into your life. Once you discover how the devil was able to work so deeply in your mind and emotions, then you can ask the Lord to forgive you and to cleanse you from this devilish operation in your soul. Once you have received this divine, clean, divine cleansing, so you can use 1 John 1, 9 for that. All right, so once you have received this divine cleansing, it's time for you to arise in the power of the Spirit with the weapons of God and the name of Jesus Christ. Begin to reject the devil's claim on your mind and emotions and command him to leave in Jesus' name. Once you do that, you'll use uh, 2 Corinthians 10, 4 and 5. And once you do that, then get back on the path to right believing and right thinking by the renewing of your mind on a daily, on a daily basis using Romans 10, you know, um, Romans 12 verse 1 and 2, you know, using the word of God daily, speaking the word into your life daily. You see, if you truly want to be permanently or you want to permanently be set free from the lies that have controlled you for so long, you will have to use the weapons of the spirit to pull down every stronghold that the devil has erected in your life. Without it, you cannot have you know freedom you have to this is something that you must do you've got to actively pull down these strongholds it's not something where you can just sit back and say oh pray for me pray for me you see this is work that you must do on your own nobody can do it for you because you you and only you know the lies that the enemy has you know infiltrated in your life you know your cultural things the lies that you've been told do you know the traditional things you know the family things. You know the lies that have entered into your mind. And only you can do that work. You see, this is where when we do counseling, people sometimes fall off because they don't want to do the work. You know, they start off, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you give them the assignment like this to go do this. You know, go figure out where things started. Oh, yeah, I'll be back. And they don't want to come back because they expected that the whole time they're coming for spiritual counseling, you are just going to be laying hands on them, praying for them, and laying hands on them, praying for them. But they don't want to do the work. I can't do the work for you. You have to do it. You have to find out. You have to find out where the door opened. So I've given you a mini spiritual diagnosis. You do the work now. How did this door open? Where did the door open? How did I allow the enemy to start coming into my mind to bring in these lies? Some people, it started in childhood. You know, so you have to go back. You have to ask the Holy Spirit to help you, to reveal to you, when did this stronghold start? Because some of it is for, it's been, a, it's been there a while. It didn't just start happening with coronavirus. For some of you, it's been there. You know, you've got to break it down. Some of you, it is a fortress for real. It has to be broken, broken, broken. It's not something that can be, you know, broken overnight. We, you know, there are some walls that, when I think about like taking a little hammer and you chip away and you chip away and you chip away, some of you will be like that, where there's some lies that you have believed for so, so, so long that you will literally have to work at it every single day to break down those lies and believe the truth. So it means that you know what the lie is, but you have to find the word, the truth and speak that truth and believe that. Start believing that. Start saying that. Meditating on that. Meditate. Now next week I'll show you how you can now take the lies and oppose the lie. So we'll do that next week. I'll show you the next part of it of how you can now take that lie and exchange it with the truth. But you, this week you need to do this work. And then next week, I'll show you the next part that will put you in a place of victory. Has this blessed you today? Amen. 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 Praise God. Minister Eva and Reverend Pauline, God bless you all. I pray you are blessed. If you have questions, feel free to reach out to us, Be Healed Global.
what is whatever I you know if you're on our website be healed global cc dot org or our email is be healed globe be healed 365 at gmail.com be blessed this week by god's grace we'll speak to you next week minister Eve and reverend pauline will close us out real quickly two three minutes and we're out god bless bye don't take long just do offering don't don't do long 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 okay. amen we're going to take up our tithes and offerings this morning Second uh, Corinthians chapter 9 from verse 5 the Bible says and that is why I thought it's necessary to urge these burdens to go to you before I do and make arrangements in advance for this bondful promised gift of yours so that it may be ready not as an exhortation wrung out of you but as a generous willing uh, generous and willing gift uh, remember this, he who sows sparingly and grudgingly will also reap sparingly and grudgingly. But he who sows generously, that the blessings may come to someone, will also reap generously with blessings. Amen. So we are going to take up our tithes and offering this mo offerings this morning. Uh, verse 5 is just telling us that uh, prepare your offering ahead of time. Don't wait till last minute and you start agonizing and, oh, how much do I give? Pray over at, when you're at home. Pray over before the service. Get your offering ready. When it's time to give, you just give your offering. Don't give grudgingly. Oh, but because God loves a cheerful giver. So give out of, um, don't give out of necessity to give because you have been blessed. Because giving is also a form of uh, warfare. Giving, God, God likes, wants us to give our tithes and offerings. Amen. Amen. So let's uh, pray over the tithes and offerings this morning or this afternoon. Father, we thank you for the gift of giving. We thank you for our tithes and offerings. We thank you, Father, for you give seed to the sow and bread for the eater. And Lord, as we have given this morning, may our seed be blessed in the name of Jesus. As we give in righteousness, we speak over our offerings to God to grow and multiply in the name of Jesus. We thank you that our tithe is also holy, O Lord. We thank you because you are rebuking the devourer for our sakes, in our ministries, in our finances, in our bodies, and everything that concerns us. For God, we give you praise, we give you honor, we give you all the majesty and dominion. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 and give you peace, 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 tranquility of heart and life continually. The name of the Lord is upon you. You are blessed. Go with God. Amen. Amen.